Dr. Terry Moran. No, oh, well, thank you. Thanks very much. Hello uh, from Washington, D.C., all the way to Appleton and uh, around the country. I'm happy to be here. I hope everyone is well and safe and happy as can be in these strange times. I'm in my office here, uh, a place that I don't come very much uh, at this point. But I'll talk a little bit about that. Look, the, the, the subject that I, that I wanted to get at is covering this pandemic, you know, covering the country uh, in, in a time of pandemic. And what I wanted to do is break it into three little parts and then open it up for questions. I want to talk about my own experience, <clears throat> which I think is very relevant. We all go through this in such an individual way. It is, it is something that everyone is experiencing, but everyone is experiencing intensely. Uh, a grand public event that we're experiencing intensely in our own lives and families and homes. So I can share a little bit of that. Then how ABC News has approached this and uh, what it means for our coverage and our, our business to some extent. And then I wanted to get to the bigger topic of how the media is doing in general and, and what it is we're trying to do. I'm watching CNN here, the president uh, up there uh, talking about, um, about testing and about the pandemic as he, as he is in this election year. So let me begin a little bit um, with my, my own story. As I say, I'm not here in my office that much. Uh, we've gone down to about 10% occupancy in our bureaus around the world. We are almost entirely telecommuting, but every day I must say I am thankful to have a job. Um, you know, it, it, is, it, it is something that we can continue to do in this way. And, and I, you know, looking at the employment numbers that come in every week is, is pretty grim. So I'm very grateful. It's a very different job, though, than I have. So, uh, I'm 60, so I'm kind of in that, you know, in, in that higher risk population. Uh, my wife, who's much younger, but she had SARS. She lived in China for two years. And uh, while she was there, she actually got SARS, the, the first coronavirus uh, epidemic that they had in China. They didn't tell her she had it, actually. Uh, she was very sick in a hospital in Tianjin, China, for four weeks. And it wasn't until she got home that the CDC asked to see her medical records. And in fact, they, they then saw some telltale signs. They said, you, have, you had SARS. So she might have some, you know, some cross reaction with that. And, you know, so we're, we're hunkering down as are uh, so many. In a job, and I, in a job that usually has taken me around the world and certainly out into the world. And uh, while I've done most of my work at home, I've been here in the bureau, but I haven't been to the White House in weeks. Uh, you know, we, we narrowed down the number of people who go to the White House. Uh, John Carl and Cecilia Vega are our main correspondents. I was over there probably once or twice a week before the pandemic. But in general, uh, you know, we've narrowed that down. And I've been working from home and doing, uh, doing some behind the scenes stuff, which I'm doing more of anyway, but also more on the streaming platform. So here's a little bit of the business of, of of ABC News, everybody is at home right now. Very few people under the age of 25 or 30 have cable anymore. Uh, people stream, right? They stream on their phones, they, they stream from the Roku and their TV or their Apple box or whatever. And that is where all news and, and broadcasting is going. And I'm happy to say that, uh, you know, that ABC has made a huge commitment, that Disney's made a huge commitment. That. Now, Working for Disney at this time, Disney owning ABC, as you can imagine, you know, that's pretty tough. Their revenue is down by one estimate, 91%. Now, that's not something that I've, I've read that in the newspaper. That's not something I would know personally at all, but they're getting clobbered. Uh, and yet, they continue to make a very significant investment, including new hires in uh, uh, production for the streaming services, the ABC News tile on your, on your screen, on your television, or, or, or on, your, on your phone or wherever. And there's a huge push into that. So that's something that I've been doing with. I'm probably gonna, we're gonna launch a politics show. I'll be, I'll be hosting that later on in the summer. So I'm keeping busy, but it's weird, isn't it? I mean, it's just, it's, um, it's strange. And I must say, having been a foreign correspondent and a White House correspondent, I see my colleagues out there 
and I get a little jealous. I'm, uh, you know, I've got a friend, one of my colleagues has gone to, um, to Italy and to Denmark and Sweden to see how they're doing things there. That's, you know, that's the kind of stuff that I'm not doing right now. That said, I, I, kinda, I, I think one of, the, one of the benefits of this has been to be home with family in a way that I haven't in years. So from a personal standpoint, uh, it's better in some ways. From a professional standpoint, it's a challenge. Now, ABC. So one of the things that, that has definitely happened, I'm in Washington, D.C., that's my job. This isn't a Washington story, is it? I mean, it's, uh, it's a story all over the world and every home in the world. And when it broke, when it really came down on us, I was optimistic in a way about journalism in this time. I thought, finally, we'll break the Trump addiction. Finally, we'll cover the world as it is, not as it is staged by the greatest reality television show producer in the world today, the current president of the United States, who knows how to get attention, who knows how to drive the news agenda, who, who is you know, kind of a savant at, at making the story about him and what he's saying and tweeting and doing every day. And because this is such an urgent story in every community in the world, all of a sudden, it seemed at the start that journalism felt like journalism again, rather than you know part, being part of the Trumpian drama. We had reports from all over. Uh, you know, ABC News has got uh, bureaus and reporters all over the world, and and to see those reports and to see reports from the meatpacking plant in in South Dakota that was hit so hard, from the Navajo Nation, from uh, all different kinds of parts of, of, of our country. I thought that's, that's, why we, that's why I got in the business to begin with. And it's those stories I think that matter the most. I keep trying to tell my colleagues that I think for a lot of people, we're interested in how other communities are handling this, how they're doing it, how they're, how they're MacGyvering their lives these days, right? How they're trying to understand how to make our way forward in life during this time before we have medications, vaccines, herd immunity, whatever it is that's gonna allow us to emerge into a different place. Uh, how, how do people do everything from going to school, from opening a business, from uh, being in an office space? As I say, you know, we've got 10% occupancy in our, in, our, in our buildings now to go into college, obviously. Those are, I did a, one of the stories that I have done is on kids going back to college. We interviewed a bunch of people through Zoom, just like this, you know, from uh, several of whom had decided, at like apparently about one out of five, one out of six high school seniors who were planning on going to college, they can't now, they aren't. It's too much to ask the family finances, or they think that it's not worth it given what they think it's going to look like, too much virtual learning to spend the money that they think they'd have to spend. And you could feel, boy, they're gonna have a different, a different life, a different take on life, uh, especially when it comes to things like the way we've, um, the way we prioritized colleges and, and, and how we, how we how we work through them. And that's a, that's a challenge I want to be part of uh, helping Lawrence solve. But all those stories about life uh, in pandemic America, and you've seen them, whether it's on ABC or elsewhere, those are the good ones. Those are the ones where you think there's added value. And yet, the thing that was surprising to me, I must say, and dismaying, is that as a country, at least on the surface, we seem to be processing this once in a lifetime, let's hope, public health emergency, a common threat to all of us in the exact same way we've processed everything else for the past three or four years. Yeah, everybody's getting in their corners, there, this, this division and rancor and bitterness uh, culturally and politically, even the pandemic, which you'd think would unite the country, seems to have divided it, or we have chosen. Now, if you look under the surface, 
if you ask questions as we do in our polls about um, about the threat that people fear, how, you know, people feel how how comfortable are you going out uh, when things reopen? You get across party lines, across uh, voter lines, 70, 80 percent agreement. For example, you know, there's there's a great deal of attention to Dr. Anthony Fauci, somebody I've known for a very long time. I've you know done a lot of interviews with him and. In fact, the last time I saw him was at the White House. I kind of pulled him aside. I told him my wife and, and SARS and, you know, was she okay? And he said, I, I think she'll be fine, you know, but you do want to be a little bit careful about that. He just switched into doctor mode right away. But he has become a figure of some controversy. Fire Fauci and, you know, a great deal of attention on Fox News uh, about Fauci. Well, the polls show that he's one of the most trusted voices in America which means that a lot of people who support Donald Trump b believe, Don believe what, uh, what uh, Dr. Fauci is saying. And in fact, Trump has kept him on board, partly because of he's trusted and because Fauci knows his lane, right? Fauci is somebody who has said, I'm a public health guy, I will give you the science. But he understands that the decision maker, Donald Trump, the constitutional officer, well, he's got to take into, into account a whole a whole range of factors and forces, primarily the economy, but many others as well. And Fauci doesn't get out of his lane, despite what he's being accused of uh, by, in some quarters. Uh, and so underneath the surface of our divisions, which we've kept up, and you know, if you're on social media, get off of it. I mean, <laughs> I think it's worse in pandemic to be on Facebook or Twitter or anything like that, because you're trapped with it. And in my experience of it is that uh, while some of it is, is informative and some of it is fun, it's one of the nice things about TikTok, by the way, is it's just goofy, really. And there's relief in that. But these others can be informative and fun, but really they have become arenas for performance of, of our antagonisms. And uh, it makes it feel like the whole country is like that. And if you watch these cable news channels, it makes it feel like like the whole country's pitted against each other at a time of pandemic, when in reality, the polls show that, that we agree on a lot of things. We agree on a lot of, of issues on how to go forward, and we certainly agree on how it feels. There are very few people being totally reckless out there. Now, let's say you're sitting in Wisconsin there, some of you, a uh, lot of attention to a few bars that opened and a few people that went into the bars. Uh, and so people are making a big, big controversy about that. But underneath, I think most people have the same sensibility that this is a very dangerous threat and that they want the best information about how it is transmitted, who is most at risk, and what are the best protections going forward in our businesses and our, in our consumerism and in, in all kinds, in our sports and all kinds of things. You see a lot of agreement in the polls about that. Uh, so I, 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 I'm dismayed by the fact that we're still doing this performance of division. But then even below that, there is the question uh, that there's something very real to, to disagree on. And that is how best to advance the public health goal that we all have, which is to keep as many of us safe as possible and get the needed testing, medications, and ultimately a vaccine to handle this. And there are two schools of thought about that. You know, one is that, that very strong lockdowns and very strong, almost coercive, compulsive public health measures is the best way. And there are others who say, you know, it's America, we can make up our own minds and we'll make them up correctly, with the right information, we'll do the right thing. I, I guess we're gonna find out, aren't we? Uh, right now, uh, you see this patchwork of approaches to opening up across the country. And covering that, I think, is very important. One of the things that I have to remind my colleagues about, and I, I do see it a lot on CNN and on the other side on Fox, uh, is, we, we shouldn't cheerlead one, one approach or scold on the other. That's not our job. Our job is to, is to 
tell, so for example, Georgia, okay? So Georgia's a state that got a lot of attention when uh, its governor, Brian Kemp, a Republican, in April, late April, announced plans to reopen, beginning with personal businesses, hair salons, which I understand. And in fact, our poll out today has a little note on that. When we ask people, would you feel confident? Would you feel safe? Would you feel comfortable doing the following things when, uh, given the risks and the benefits when your state or your locality opens up? And most people on most issues say, no, not yet, except for two places. One, grocery stores. Two, hair salons. I guess, you know, that's uh, everybody's feeling. I know my wife is. She's, uh, she's is a short hair person and she's going crazy after seven weeks. She, she offered to cut my hair. Uh, and I said, honey, this hair, this hair pays the mortgage. And it would be like, you know, Patrick Mahomes saying his girlfriend could do shoulder surgery on him. But uh, that's a lame attempt at humor. But I think what, what you saw in Georgia was the beginnings of uh, you know, Brian Kemp, the governor, trying to open up with these small local businesses who are so in dire need of help, hair salons, uh, tattoo parlors, gyms and such. Uh, and there was, there was prediction of terrible disaster, uh, which may yet come, but there was a great deal of scolding uh, of, of Georgia at the time, uh, the Atlantic uh, magazine and website uh, had, uh, had the headline, you know, George's Experiment in Human Sacrifice. And for a while on Twitter, this shows why one should limit one's exposure to Twitter, that the hashtag, you know, Kemp has blood on his hands, uh, was trending. And here we are now, and they've, they've now been completely open for a couple of weeks. And the, the University of Washington's uh, Institute on Health Metrics and Evaluation, the IHME, perhaps you've seen that. That is the, the group that uh, models how many will be infected, how many will survive, how many will die, that, that the federal government uses and many state government uses. They had uh, revised their model for Georgia after the governor decided to open up, saying Georgia would have Oh, cases in their into August uh, in their hundreds and about 1,700 a day by June 12th, which was uh, a marker for them. They revised it downward yesterday, day before yesterday. No cases in Georgia in August, the model claims. And, uh, and from 1,700 on June 12th to about 300. Why? You know, I, I think one of the things we're all recognizing, and reporters need to recognize it especially. This is a new virus in the human population. It is not enough to say we're, we trust the science. I mean, it is, but the science is new. It's important to recognize the science is new. And we don't know uh, how it's going to do in warmer, hot weather. It looks, there are some indications it would, you know, that it'll decrease some, that it will increase. But as a reporter, your job is not to take sides in that. And I do feel that, that on, you know, in this CNN and, and Fox, they've got to fight all the time of, you know, stake out some battleground. There's no battleground. The, the virus doesn't care who you voted for. The, the, the idea is we should tell straight, which is why I like the, the journalism that goes directly to, to someone's story or to a community and tells it straight, doesn't scold people, but asks, how are you doing this? How are you making sense? Because that's where most people are, I think. And when I see journalism like that, uh, on ABC, I actually think ABC has done uh, a lot of good work because David Muir on, on the evening news, Nightline, uh, which for a time was at 11.30, back in its old, in its old time slot when I did it, uh, they've just done great, great work. And by going places, which is difficult since uh, we are not allowed to fly anywhere, so we, we either have people driving. My colleague, Matt Gutman, drove. Actually, he did fly. He flew from California to South Dakota in order to cover the, the meatpacking plant in Sioux Falls, which had the, the outbreak. And then drove back across the country to counties where there, were, there was no coronavirus at all. 
and it was remarkable, uh, a remarkable journey. Those ki that kind of reporting has been very, very good. The Washington reporting, I think, remains because of the dominance of the president's personality. Um, it, it remains locked in that combative, divided mode which is why the other day, and let me see where we are. I'll go a few more minutes and then open it up for, for questions. Um, the other day the, there was a hearing in the Senate, you may have seen it, uh, on the pandemic. It, 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 was, um, it was a very, it was an interesting hearing. And I think that the main thing out of it, from, from my point of view, they had Dr. Fauci was up there and uh, Dr. Redfield of the CDC and uh, the Secretary of uh, Health and Human Services, uh, Scott Hahn, and Brett Giroir, who is the, uh, the Assistant Secretary in charge of, of testing. Um, it was remarkable that without the Trump element, I'm not criticizing, he's, he is who he is, that's, that's, that's who's, who, he's our president. But without that, all of a sudden, you realize that governing could be boring again. I anchored it here at, at ABC News for the, the streaming service. So I watched the whole thing soup to nuts. It was substantive. It was, it was genuine and probing. And it made me think uh, it was factual as far as these facts can be ascertained. It, ascertained. it made me think that those White House briefings, which turned into such shows, uh, you know, my wife was watching him every day. I said, honey, don't, you don't. Because she's not a fan of the current president. And, you know, she got angry. And I'm like, it's, they only focus on the stuff that matters. And that back and forth, and I'll, I'll close on this. The, if you watched one of those briefings a couple of weeks ago, the president was asked, the president cut off the, uh, the briefing at this point. He was asked by a reporter uh, for CBS News. Wei Jia Ling, Jeng, I can't remember her name now. Uh, he was asked by a reporter for CBS News a question along the lines of, you keep talking about how, how great our country is doing compared to uh, other countries in the world in terms of testing. And I think, why is it a competition? She said, why, is it, why are you making it a global competition when there's still so many uh, thousands of people dying in this country every week? And, you know, what do you say to that? And Trump got angry at her and said, well, why don't you ask China? I just China. My kids, by the way, they, when they hear him say that, they laugh because he says it funny to their mind. And there was a palpable feeling that he had said it because she's of Chinese descent. Uh, and she asked him, why'd you ask me? Why, why do you ask me? Why do you ask me that question? And he tried to move on and then just cut the press conference off. I looked at that as, bad faith on both parts. What's the answer to her question? I mean, I, I, I get it. Trump is who he is. He wants to, he's a man who boasts. Let's, let's put it that way. I think even people who support him would recognize he's a, he's not a guy who's shy about telling you how great he is. Uh, that's how he got where he is. And he wants everything to sound great. He's a, you know, he's been a salesman in some ways uh, his, his whole life for his business and then his reality TV show. And what are you going to get? What substantively are you going to get? I would have preferred to ask what his position, you know, what is your administration's policy on asymptomatic testing? You keep saying everybody can get a test. What if people who don't have symptoms? Well, what about sentinel testing where you're just testing communities to see where it is? Are you, any, you know, Nobody asked him policy questions. They asked him questions that, that get this performative, you know, I'm fighting with you, you're fighting with me, and that's the bite on the evening news. So I kind of feel that we're still stuck in that rut in one lane of journalism. But if you look certainly at ABC News, and I think in, in other places as well, when they're actually going out to report the story, uh, you can learn a lot. Because my feeling, as I've, as I've told my colleagues, I think at the end of the day, so many colleges, like our alma mater, uh, so, many, so many businesses, so many restaurants, and, and so many families and schools are going to be MacGyvering this thing for a while, right? I mean, if you remember that old TV series, they're, 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 you're going to kind of figure out how to do it with creative solutions, with, with kind of 
baling wire and scotch tape and, and whatever. And you're seeing that in your, in your own life, I'm sure. Some of that is interesting. I also find interesting uh, at a very personal level how people process risk. You know, risk is a, is a very personal, very, my wife and I have different degrees of risk, uh, risk tolerance. And how do people work through that? And, and then how do communities take care of, 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 what they, of the people they need to take care of and, the, and the, the phenomena that they need to take care of? Those stories are valuable. They're out there. I think the politics story is not being well covered uh, by anybody because it remains locked in this performative divisiveness. Look, we're going to have a real debate. We are going to have a real debate if Biden can come out of this house at some point, I think he will, uh, and that'll be good. And it's an election year, and at the end of the day, you know what, it's gonna be up to the, to the American people if they can get to the polls. Uh, but I think our, our job should be the more straight stories that we can tell from around, not just geographically, but thematically. Uh, Americans who are experiencing, American institutions that are experiencing this pandemic, the better election we'll have at the end of the day, rather than this, you know, the Trump show, right? Which has been dominant in our, in our coverage for so long. So those are some of my thoughts and, and my experiences. I know that everybody else has, has their own. And I always love asking for questions uh, about the media because I get them. Uh, it's, it's kind of a national sport and, um, and I'm glad, I'm glad. So have at me.